We are on a mission, a mission to save and revitalize independent pharmacy. On the Catalyst podcast, we dive into current events that are shaping how pharmacists approach their patients and their businesses. Fuel your passion for pharmacy one conversation at a time. Three, two, one, zero. Ignition. Welcome to the Catalyst Pharmacy Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Bivens, Vice President of Business Development with Pioneer X. I'm here with my co-host, Josh. And I'm Josh Allen, Vice President of Clinical Strategy at Pioneer X. And today we're here with Lisa Hines, Vice President of Performance Management at the Pharmacy Quality Alliance. Um, I've met your dogs. And can you uh, <laughs> tell, us, tell us a little bit about Doug? Doug. So Doug, <laughs> Doug. is n- named um, perfectly. Would you agree? Oh, yeah. Doug is named yeah. perfect. I want to hear about this dog. He's dumb. I should <laughs> like, bring him in here. Yeah. Doug, like, he's like, you know, hits his head a lot. You know? Huh. Yeah, uh, like, but Josh, do, do we want to tell a story about what Doug did to a family member or not? Oh, yeah. I think that's totally fair game. Okay. So Josh's lovely wife was over and giving Doug so much love and saying how sweet he is and what a good boy and petting him all night long, and he could never get enough. And as they're about to leave our house, Doug lifted his leg on her. Oh, my yeah. goodness. All right. But it, well, his, isn't that a, like a sign of affection? <laughs> like, I don't that, know. I, I think isn't it's that a, like it's a I really liked her? <laughs> right. Yeah, he's like, I own you. I really yeah. liked her. I want to yeah. keep you. But in, in Doug's defense, he's one of the sweetest dogs. Like he's just super, <laughs> super nice. I got a really dumb one too. Uh, yeah. Mine's a little brown. I don't know what he is. They think he's a Pomeranian, but he's like 40 pounds. No, he's, 30, he's like 20 like 25, pounds. 30 pounds. And uh, he just... Is a is a ball of stupidness. Um, yeah, he walks backwards on any slick surface. You know, slick well, surface. You're gonna watch my dog moonwalk out of the room. <laughs> that's <laughs> fantastic. It's so good. I don't it's know. If, probably effective. It's uh, it, it really is. He'll he'll walk in, come say hi to you, and then if you're like on a hardwood floor or you're on a tile surface, he's gonna literally moonwalk back all the way back. That, you need to video that. Yeah, like we need video. <laughs> it's like of the that. TV show New Girl and uh, Nick. That <laughs> Nick's is awesome. character. That is a good one. So, yeah, yeah, it's pretty. It gets really anxious, and he's like, you know what? Moon, welcome back. Can you, like, give us a little bit of your background and, and how you kind of got into the PQA um, role that you're in. Sure. Yeah, I was engaged as a volunteer at PQA. I was a co-chair of one of their working groups and developed m- many or you know, supported the development of many of the measures that I'm happy to support today as an employee of PQA. So it was actually one of my favorite organizations to be engaged in. I loved going to the PQA annual meeting and networking with a pharmacy and quality focus and um, just felt like my people. So I was, I was honored to join their staff. And so you and I are both um, CVS alumni in a, yeah, Easy. Sometimes proud yeah, of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, easy on this show. <laughs> <laughs> um, did, so were you involved with PQA when you were back at the CVS area, or is this after? I was post-CVS. I was in academia. I worked for the University of Arizona um, and was a drug interaction researcher. Really? Uh, focused on, like, clinical decision support and other methods to reduce drug interactions. And so I supported the development of the drug interaction PQA measure as well as the opioid measures. But so that's how I got involved with research. Nice. Uh, you did some, uh, I, I know we keep going further and further back, but you did some like um, a pharmacist role, I'm going to call it, sorry, I'm going to butcher this to a degree, but in a, in a kind of a physician practice setting, is that, am I right? Yeah, you know this, huh? I, I think <laughs> so. I thought that was really interesting. I wanted to talk about it a little bit. Yeah, old school, old school, but still, um, you know, way back in the day, worked in a family medicine residency training program clinic um, in Ohio. And Ohio is pretty progressive in terms of pharmacy. Okay. And um, it was fantastic. It was great. So medical education had residents and students and saw patients and they did billing, incident to billing. And I also did that in Arizona when I oh. was at Midwestern University there in a family medicine office. So really cool. Really cool stuff. 
So under like a collaboration with that doctor, some type of an agreement with that doctor, you're you're seeing the stuff, you're seeing the patients in the scope of what a pharmacist. Yeah, I mean, I don't. It wasn't a formal collaboration. They they build for what I did, right? Nice. Was the pharmacy attached to that, one. or you were just the only pharmacist oh, there? So, like, why on earth was I doing this? Yeah. So <laughs> I was I, I was an embedded clinical pharmacist for a health system. Okay. And you know, it was some, somewhat of an experiment, but I documented my outcomes and A one Cs and smoking cessation rates and things like that. You know, way back in the day, I was measuring. Man. Yeah. Yeah, that's. Yes. That, I mean, really, like I, maybe that was a fairly common thing. I I, I don't know. That's no. even no. folks no. now are, are are saying that's really progressive. Yeah, yeah. Um, we're still not great at measuring stuff in general. Yeah, there was a clinic pharmacy um, right next door, and worked for this you know same health system, and you know we worked together. So, so coming out of pharmacy school, like, what drove you to want to measure things? I actually, I was trained that way. Um, went to the Ohio State Uh-oh. University. Uh-oh. There's always a little tension here <laughs> we'll with to, Josh and it's being right. a, a, everyone. Josh is a, a University of Texas grad, so they're going to beef probably a little bit on the show. Nah, right now, right now <laughs> Ohio State's probably got us in the bag for most things. No so. doubt. That's true. Yeah, UT Austin. Great school. Great school. I hope my daughters go there. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I, I think, you know what, I actually, when I was residency trained, I was doing a lot of um, working in the QA um, quality assurance um, department and c- learned about metrics then, okay. so more in the hospital arena. Moving kind of into the measures piece then, mm-hmm. how, how, how does, I, I, know it, I know you guys work with Equip and, and you, what you guys do is develop, test, and, and, and I really, I, I look at it as building a, with building a framework in an area that could use some structure for measurement. It, you think? <laughs> it, it, I, I'm, I'm, I think I'm close. Um, how, how does something like that even come to fruition? So PQA is different than PQS, right? Um, PQA is a nonprofit um, started mm-hmm. in 2006 as a public private partnership um, to assess medication use quality for uh, Medicare Part D beneficiaries. And so PQA has historically, and for the vast majority of our measures, developed health plan measures. And it's kind of a misnomer because people think, oh, pharmacy measures, but it's, it's really medication measures at the health plan level. And Equip started as a, um, or a PQS, uh, mm-hmm. Pharmacy Quality Solutions, which is a sister organization to PQA, right. uh, has the Equip platform and started as a quality improvement tool for pharmacies to be able to help health plans drive um, on on those measures um, is, is largely how that came to be. Um, but PQA's measures are largely health plan measures and were not intended to be used to, to, to assess, the degree that to, they're being used today. To, yeah, 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 how yeah, they're being used that. is not how they're intended to be used. And so we're doing a lot of work to, as to your point, um, work through the feasibility and infrastructure and working with you know, organizations like yours um, involved in documenting um, clinical, um, potential clinical measures for the future for pharmacy. So, well, you know, that's the direction we're heading in is really developing measures for pharmacy evaluation. But um, right now we have only have a few actual pharmacy measures. Right. Because it turns out they're really hard to get. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Right? You know, it's it's one of the things where we were talking and you know it's it's crazy that when I graduated in 2008 they were talking about like right around the corner you're going to get pharmacy lab results you know vital sign measures you're going to be able to send them to these magical health information exchanges mm-hmm. and there is this utopia of everybody having all the data and you know we all know that yeah that just didn't that's happen. That's hard. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, I mean, you guys with your um, being an e-care plan vendor are able to push clinical data, but, you know, have you been receiving any meaningful data? I mean, so, are some, pharmacists still flying blind? Um, for the most part, um, we've just started earlier, really, I guess, earlier this year, yeah. we finally started with some of the new script stuff that came through. Um, the new script standard on electronic prescriptions actually has a ton of information embedded in it. 
Um, okay. And so we started pulling vitals from that. So today, and this is one of those, if the mm-hmm. EHR yeah, has if, them set yeah. up at this point and they've right. registered and certified on the new script standard, they can send over labs, multiple ICD-10 codes, um, and then you know height, weight, weight, blood pressure, things blood like that. Pressure, so yeah. more information than pharmacists have ever gotten in one e-script, which is pretty cool. And then did you say diagnosis? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, the cool part about it, we've been able to get diagnosis for a while, uh-huh. um, but the e-script standard actually allows them to send three. So if you have multiple, right? Um, you know, before it was, and ICD-10 Primary coding or... is just weird, right? Mm-hmm. You get whatever the person who picked it guessed. So at least mm-hmm. now you get Hopefully you get more guess. yeah it, it's a lot of guessing. Um, you get more granular information now, and so one of the things that you know, and you guys have to deal with this, I'm sure, when you get a ton of information, you have to figure out what's right and what mm-hmm. to do with it. So if you get you know 50 different lab values and they're all different, mm-hmm. okay, which which one do you use and how do you know whose is right? And that just gets more and more complicated as you have multiple sources of information and sharing, you know, Mm -hmm. if you have five doctors that all send you a weight and all five weights are different. Yeah. You, you just got less good information. Huh? I hadn't thought of that. Is it time stamped? I mean, even if it, even if it were, Uh which one's right? Is the last one right? Was their scale correct? I mean, it's just, there's just too many, there's so many variables that you have to figure out. And that's the, mm-hmm. the big challenge. Yeah. You said something to the effect of, you know, we have these measures and they're the way they're being applied today, um, with, uh, DRR fees or, or, or whatever that, <clears throat> that kind of, um, element of that piece of it really, when, when those measures were originally developed, it wasn't necessarily meant to impact an individual pharmacy at that level? Absolutely not. Yeah. Yeah. So I I guess to kind of even level set, what were the measures initially intended to do? They were used to evaluate Part D, no, um, standalone PDPs, um, prescription drug plans, and um, Medicare Advantage plans um, with the prescription drug benefit in Medicare Part D. And I mean, that's it. They, these are health plan measures for use in Medicare Part D. You know, and then there was the evolution of the star ratings and bonus payments and that that money. The money has been a driver, right? And, you know, fortunately, our measures are adopted across a variety of CMS quality programs. So there's alignment. Um, I do think it makes sense for there to be alignment f- how pharmacies are measured with you know, the overall landscape, but uh, the PQA health plan measures were tested and evaluated for health plan use only. So that's really the only thing that has kind of that, that their PQA endorsed for. That, that, that makes sense. And, mm-hmm. and so now as you guys are moving toward pharmacy quality measures, mm-hmm. You know, the, one of the things you mentioned was alignment, and that's been a lot of the, the stuff that's been talked about on some of the work groups. Um, mm-hmm. You know, like if CMS is measuring a plan based on certain things and that plan is getting reports from the pharmacies around PDC and adherence, you know, a lot of those pharmacy measures don't necessarily have to be exactly PDC, but they should be items that affect those things. So everybody's kind exactly. of measured fairly right. on the things that they mm-hmm. should be measured on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So how can you drive improvement in quality? It doesn't have to be the exact same measure, right? Right. Um, So what pharmacy services or interventions can support overall population health um, is the question. And we have um, three technical expert panels right now convened. One of them is more of a composite um, adherence measure. So that would align with the STAR ratings. Uh, the other other two technical expert panels are focused on, and one of them is blood pressure assessment and reporting and A1C assessment and reporting. So a, a step forward towards a clinical measure, like think about A1C at goal and blood pressure at goal. And then another is focused on behavioral health. So, um, you know, blood pressure and A1C 
you know, diabetes and high blood pressure are kind of low hanging fruit, but right. going into behavioral health medication management for patients with depression. Right. So really looking at things that drive big healthcare costs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like, if we could really, I mean, it's a lot harder, but, uh, been hearing the need for really what could pharmacists do with related to COPD or asthma, you know, those are, um, big dollars associated with those morbidities. So yeah, there's a lot of exciting opportunities. Uh, I think, like I said, the the low hanging fruit are your common chronic conditions. Is the data structure there or is the data, I'm going to say infrastructure there on the pharmacist side to, to uh, accommodate tracking that, pushing that, trending it? It depends on what you measure, right? And that's where, you know, if, BQA tells us what we need to measure, then you can get that stuff. Um, and then communicating mm-hmm. it's probably the e-care plan or some kind of, there has to be some kind of objective way to hit that. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I mean, I can see that in a value-based arrangement, right? Yeah. Right. Now, and that was, that was kind of where I was going to go. So do you get, mm-hmm. you think that if you can develop pharmacy-based measures that say these three things drive a quality pharmacy, mm-hmm. um, do you do you see that interacting in value based care to say if you guys hit these three things, you're in this you know kind of enhanced network where you can get paid for providing these services? Yeah, I mean that that's where we're, we want to go, and I think I think the path forward is some you know pilot and demonstration projects, some learnings from there are already um, value based arrangements that you know, where there's evaluation of things like ED visits or total cost of care. I I think we're a ways away from there to having a standardized measure to do that, um, you know, for community pharmacy um, or independent pharmacies, you know, those are probably easier to measure in an integrated delivery network or health system, but absolutely. Um, So yeah, we're really interested in, in learning about opportunities for health plan sharing of data with a network of pharmacies, for example, and exchange of data to on which to build measures and, and get to what you're talking about, Josh. You know, it's one of those weird things. Where, so I, I came out of the renal specialty world and all of my patients were dialysis patients. So they were really expensive, mm-hmm. really chronically care, you know, really chronic management was intense. Um, and the, the interesting thing is you can make a much, much bigger impact by managing patients in CKD stage three and four before they were on dialysis, but all mm-hmm. of the dollars went to managing dialysis, not to managing the prevention, mainly because there aren't good objective measures to say this CKD stage three patient is successfully measured. Right. You were successfully pre- preventing that right. to progress. Yeah. I mean, really the craziest part is the only successful measure of CKD three to four and then to dialysis is, did you go on dialysis? Right. So if I measure somebody or if I manage somebody successfully, and this is true of asthma and hypertension, you may not have a negative outcome for 30 years, which is what you want, but it's hard to measure. Yeah, that's, that's like a, a, a focused population that we really could have some demonstration of value for, for pharmacists resolving medication therapy problems. Uh, I, you know, I, I think that that's a, an area ripe for research and demonstration projects for pharmacy, for sure. What is the process today for when PQA is going, hey, we want to attack an area, um, mm-hmm. I feel like I need some framework. What's the process of getting a measure... I guess from Genesis to, to, okay, cool. I think we're, we're good. It's complete. It's finalized, but what, what's the process of kind of measured development at PQA? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think one of the biggest questions is, is what, what do you start to develop? How do you mm-hmm. decide and who drives that? Um, so PQA, we do still develop health plan measures and develop them based on an identified gap. Um, and that's usually through environmental scans clinical practice guidelines that are evolving um, where we're having to retire existing measures and develop new ones as the guidelines evolve. So evidence, there has to be evidence. Um, A measure is not important unless it's evidence-based and can drive improvements in quality. So there needs to be a quality gap too. Um, And, 
you know, PQA has a consensus-based transparent process where we have um, open comment periods um, and okay. open to the public as well as our members. We have two of those, one before we proceed with development and one before we have a, a, a measure near the finish line. And then there's all this technical specification and testing and all that. And by the time a measure gets through all of our, our technical panels and vetting and feedback from members and subject matter experts, it's you know, fully specified and meets the criteria of a good measure including scientific acceptability and feasibility and all that. And then we have a membership uh, vote. Uh, but, but by the time a measure gets there, um, it, it's just, it's ready. You know, it's just a bow on yeah. the measure to have that endorsement. Yeah, because you've had so um, many iterations and probably yeah. feedback on it. That makes sense. Yeah, and, and actually it's really hard. It's really hard to develop pharmacy measures that can get to that um, level of scientific rigor because of the data infrastructure issues. So I think in the meantime, we're going to need to see what we can do um, with partners, our members and non-members alike, to see what's possible in terms of measurement. And, you know, that data infrastructure has to be there before we can have a, a, a pharmacy measure that a pharmacy could be held accountable to where there's dollars attached um, in a way that, is you know, quote fair, right? Right. Yeah, that makes <laughs> so, sense. Right. And, and hope valid. Hopefully, bonus dollars, not punitive dollars, right? Right. Right. Of course, we don't have control over that, but that's yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, no, I get it. Definitely, definitely the preferred, um, you know, carrots. Carrots yeah. versus sticks. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So basically, what we're hearing, you know, measures can be done in what two or three months. Oh my gosh! No. <laughs> Sounds like a week, oh, about a that's, week, that's, week session. That sounds laughable. like about a week. Right? Oh, I love it. I love it. Yeah. No, um, I'd say 18 months. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. That's so a... that's, that's a bit, that's, you know, we, we do our best. Um, sure. And we're always iterating on our process and, uh, you know, I've, having a data driven, so mm -hmm. it's informed, you know, having an iterative process and, you know, once we have a measure that's endorsed, um, we improve on them over time too. So we okay. don't, it's just not, we're it's not, done. It's not a one and done kind of piece. No, yeah. I mean, I would say 80% of my team's work is, is dedicated to maintaining the measures and ensuring they reflect current evidence and, and guidelines. And, and then there's all the codes that we need to update, including the NDC codes and all that. So as pharmacies and, and in particular, I always try to look through the vein of our pharmacies are, mm -hmm. are generally a, a approaching more and more clinical services. Mm -hmm. And you talk about measure development around clinical services. It seems that right. to me seems, and, and you guys are always looking, is it always looking at a, at a health plan level? Um, but how do you, how do you approach or what, what are some of the measures kind of being tossed out from measuring quality in a clinical services environment for pharmacies? Yeah. So a health plan measure evaluates a health plan. And so how do you evaluate a pharmacy and how do you have this, what we call attribution? Right. What's that population of patients upon that serves as the denominator of the measure? Is it all of their patients? Mm -hmm. Is it their Medicare patients? Is it their Medicare, Medicare patients from a specific plan? Mm -hmm. um, so those are a lot of the questions that we're answering. I mean, I think having a more comprehensive measure across all um, payers um, is a better picture of quality, but payers tend to only be interested in their own patient cohort. So, you know, there's, we have lots of stakeholders with lots of opinions about what that looks like, but that attribution model is really important to get right. 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 I mean, if you think about it, it's one of those, like if you're measuring one single Medicare Part D plan, that's pretty easy. Your regular pharmacy may have 50 or 60 plans that they have patients for, and if you're terrible at 58 of them and great at two, mm -hmm. two of those plans are really happy. The others are not. So it's weird to say like your overall quality is great or bad when it may mm -hmm. not be relevant to everybody. Yeah. I mean, from a patient perspective, you want to think that you're receiving the best care possible regardless of who's paying for the claims right. or yeah. the medications. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's lots of, lots of nuances. Um, but if, if there is like a value-based 
arrangement, you know, to me there, there you, it's a little bit more natural and, and easier to figure out. Right. And the interesting thing is you kind of have to think about which enemies do you want to make? You could <laughs> find out that if you measure pharmacies objectively across the board, you may find out that some of the pharmacies that you thought were amazing aren't, and you may find that some that kind of flew under the radar are amazing. I mean, hopefully, you know, from a community pharmacy perspective, especially independent, we firmly think that independent pharmacies provide better care, and hopefully the objective measures show that. But, man, could you imagine if you prove that CBS <laughs> does, in fact, provide really bad service? We would love oh, you, I, yeah. but... <laughs> <laughs> I've I've been involved in research and the results were not what I what wanted and thought. that yeah <laughs> what yeah. you kind of had a, had a notion of that's interesting. So an important point that I want to talk about is and it, it's a little bit technical but I think conceptually people will get this is that you need a a big enough denominator in a measure for it to be valid and the more that we slice and dice down to a single pharmacy for a single payer you might only have a handful of patients and you can't extrapolate what's going on with those few patients to something that's valid. And it, um, the analogy we use is batting averages. Um, you know, how, how many um, pitches do you need to, ha you know, have a, a valid batting average? Right. You, you know, if they struck out the first three that, you know, that's not meaningful. So hopefully I'm making sense. No, and, mm -hmm. and, and you talk baseball, Josh, I'm good. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, Josh is really good about um, simplifying technical concepts for, for others. I, I'm not as good at that. But it's an important concept to understand that you need to have enough. And it's just like when a research study. You need to have your sample size big enough to have right. valid results. And, and diverse so. enough, right? Like you can't have yeah, the same batter hitting against the same pitcher constantly. Right? <laughs> Yeah. Or you step up, hit a home run on your first at bat, and then retire with the best <laughs> batting good. average in history. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Yes. See? That makes sense. And That'd be something I would totally park. do. <laughs> and go down in the book with like a perfect 1,000 batting average. Yeah. Yeah. I did it. I did it. Yep. Yeah. Done. I don't think I've ever been <laughs> in those shoes like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for anything, to be honest. Um, I guess since it's on everybody's mind, um, what are you guys doing around COVID? At least for measurement development. I, I see you're working from home, so we know you're. <laughs> we know you're. Yeah, we're yeah, clearly remote, but yeah. I mean, we're we're following um, what's going on. You know, are we ready to have a, a COVID measure? Mm, um, not yet. You know, I, I would say I think I think that to have a, a quality measure, you need to have some specific guidelines, and then do some retrospective evaluation and there's going to need to be some stability in the guidelines and the products that are available and even the target populations. Um, and, and that's rapidly evolving with the nature of the pandemic. So there's that. And then you think about measuring immunizations just in the first place. Right. Take. So I'm, I'm just talking about immunizations because that's the natural. I mean, this is really pharmacy's time, right. In terms of becoming, a primary care, right? The most access. accessible, right? Yeah. Point to, to do yeah. that. So I mean, this this crisis has really created a, a, an amazing opportunity, and yeah, we do see such great opportunity in measuring pharmacists delivered immunization services, identifying gaps, closing those gaps. Um, you know, flu and flu vaccines and, and, and COVID, making sure that second vaccine is, is administered. So, you know, I think that we need to keep moving forward in terms of building out the infrastructure for immunization measures and that that'll just be easy to follow on with, um, just add on that on the COVID uh, vaccine. Yeah. And it's weird, you know, if everything goes as planned, by the time you know what you need, hopefully it's done and you never have to do it again. Right. So it'd be weird. You, you kind of, I guess you're, I think you're right on that saying, figuring out what those immunization measures are, mm -hmm. you know, by the time you can investigate measure and ballot and release COVID measures, if you're 18 months from start to finish, I sincerely hope we're done with the pandemic in that 18 month period. 
Yeah. So how ready, how ready is Pioneer RX in terms of capturing this information and being able to push it out? Oh, I love that question. Right. Um, Josh would love to answer. We that. are on it. Um, so the, the <laughs> nice part about it is um, we've been working with some pharmacies in specific states around reporting testing to public health. Um, it just it also highlights the fact that in this country we don't have a single public health department. We have hundreds of them. You know, like mm -hmm. New York, for example, like New York City public health has a different reporting requirement than New York state right because right. new york city is just so big they can be like hey this is what we need right and you have 50 states and you know large metroplexes have different stuff so it's really kind of highlighted how fragmented a lot of that is mm -hmm. um, but you know we we have pharmacies right now testing reporting that testing into public health um, and then you know we have pharmacies gearing up clearly for immunizations so we're t we're kind of staying on the all of our We've added in the labs that we capture all the link codes mm -hmm. for COVID tests. Um, we're working on care goals to help really drive pharmacies to remind patients mm -hmm. for that second injection follow-up. So treated very much like the Shingrix, mm -hmm. where once you do the first one, we're going to create those active reminders for the second round. Um, so we're prepared. But at the same time, we're still waiting for guidelines too, right? Yeah. You know, up until last week, we didn't know if it was going to be Pfizer or Moderna or both. Mm -hmm. We still don't. I still don't. <laughs> we don't know what that that gap is. You know, like with some immunizations you have, you do your first set, first round and then your second round has to be done between X days and Y, y days later. Mm -hmm. Right now, we're just going off of press release. It's 28 days for Pfizer and I think 22 days for Moderna now. I think so, yeah. Does and that, what's the tolerance for variation? Right. right. Yeah, are, if you're a day late, are you – totally hosed? Do you have a week? You know, yeah. those are all the things that that's what makes good pharmacy management when you mm -hmm. know what those tolerances are and how you can manage around them. And right now we just don't know. I have a couple of questions. So what are the states that it, it's, there's great reporting to a registry? Like where are those states that are doing it right um, with pharmacy? There's actually quite a few, you know, if you, if you look at some of our partners where, you know, we, we work with STC and, um, they've got bi-directional immunization reporting in a lot of States. Um, Arizona is great, um, mm -hmm. where STC is from. They, mm -hmm. they do a lot of immunization reporting. Great. Texas is not amazing. Um, yeah. so <laughs> shout out to Texas. Um, it's, it's opt in yeah. only, which is completely insane. Oh, uh, the opting, yeah. It's, yes. it's not, it, yeah. It, yeah. That's right. Is it more than one state like that? Or is there? Um, um, as yeah. far as I know, Texas is the only opt in state, but Th thanks, I Texas. think there were still a few states that had a semi functional immunization reporting system. So maybe we're not 50th worst, but like 47. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. I forgot about the opting in and, um, to the registries, it should it should at a minimum be an opt out, right? Right, right, right. yes. Um, yeah, and then you ha you of course have to build in the infrastructure to accommodate that um, in in your tools. So one of the things that that is of interest as well is, and it's not easy. So we've got adult immunizations, which have largely been a priority because there's less infrastructure to drive adult immunization. You know, like if you're in except for maybe the military, um, if you think about school systems, right. you know, and yeah. requirements for immunizations with some, some exceptions. But with the pandemic and with a decrease in primary care visits, uh, we know that pediatric immunization rates have fallen. And, you know, I, I, so are you ready to um, support pediatric immunizations? Is that already built out for those? Um, for those states or for those pharmacy systems where that's um, occurring. Yeah. I mean, on our end, we can record them, report them, all the things that right. pharmacy, as long as the pharmacy is available and, and legally able to do those things, mm -hmm. we're set. Uh, mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, you brought up an interesting point with the pandemic. We don't really know what kind of measures that's, or what kind of effect on quality that's going to have over the next, 
you know, two, five, maybe even 10 years where you saw mm-hmm. people put off stuff that they shouldn't have, mm-hmm. decreased preventive care. I mean, dental work, I think, is going to be is a huge yeah, area <laughs> where my, my dentist won't and stop who, calling me. Yeah. <laughs> I understand. Yeah. But and I mean, who doesn't want to put off a colonoscopy, uh, right? Uh, uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> be, right, be like, yeah, like, yeah any we, excuse, we'll any excuse. <laughs> but, you know, like you know, in a lot of those things, we have to be prepared to measure the the long term effects of what happened to humans in the pandemic, and mm-hmm. a lot of that won't be re- realized until Years, yeah. later down the road. Mm-hmm. I mean, even if you think about schools, you know, like, mm-hmm. what happens Mental when health. you, yeah. yeah. What happens when you don't really have day to day school for a year? Yeah, no, my um, my kids are going through that now. They're they're at um, they're both remote learning and have been since the school year started. And they are, um, you know, they're some days they're they're great, and then other days are on the struggle bus. You know, you just need some mm-hmm. sports helped with some of that for them. And and yeah, you're right. What kind of long term? I really think about that kind of stuff. What kind of long-term effect does that have either on relationships or just mental health in general, how you deal with stuff? Right. Socialization. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and, you know, this kind of will wrap it back into like measuring social determinants of health. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're all lucky enough to have jobs that we still got to keep through the pandemic and mm-hmm. our kids have the ability to, you know, stay at home in a safe place with good internet and, mm-hmm. and- and nutrition. learn their class, right? right. And nu- yeah, and having you know, but there, there's a large nutrition. number of kids that go to school where that's the only place they've been safe that whole day. Mm-hmm. That's the only place they get fed that whole day, mm-hmm. um, and they actually they don't have cable or internet or anything else at home, and so you've got an entire this huge gap of kids who have the resources and those who don't, um, and it's just amplified over this last year. And what does that look like? You know, those kids are going to go from fifth grade to sixth grade, and next year they're going to be wholly unprepared to stay up with yeah. their cohort. So I I went to a um, provider recently, and the check in was super like I'm like, oh, this is SDOH screening, um, you know, and I and I know that there's a lot of discussion because there's so many touch points with the pharmacy. Is what role could pharmacists have in this screening? Number one, you know, and what standard type of tool should be used? And then, you know, how do you triage that? I mean, it's right. irresponsible to collect the information and then go. And, and then we just got this go, information. I got it now. Right. right. Oh, oh, they're food insecure. Right. Right. That's, a, you know, the last couple of PQA leadership meetings have really focused on social determinants. And everybody really, it's like super interesting it's really mm-hmm. powerful. It's probably the biggest driver of improving healthcare that we haven't touched yet. Mm-hmm. And we still don't have any idea how to do anything with it. At least not for real. Like there's a lot of places where they're piloting things, but okay. So I, I know this child doesn't have food. How do I fix that? Mm-hmm. So from that end, um, you know, just kind of what you're looking at, what do you think is the most important social determinant to measure in community pharmacy right now? Whether we can or not, just if you had a unicorn, what do we measure? Which one? Mm-hmm. The, the most important one. Only one. Just one. Only one. <laughs> you, Goodness you gracious. Totally yeah. me. I'm, I'm kidding. I, this, I'll, I'll this loosen up. You can give me top three. Let's That's fine. <laughs> no, no, no. You, back to you, Josh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Tell I like me. that. How about you, Josh? I, I don't know. I am. Okay. I, oh, I'm okay. Sorry. I know, I would say that um, I don't know what that is. Um, PQA is collecting information and we have initiatives for 2021 to evaluate um, social determinants of health that could be captured by pharmacists, um, what's being done, um, what makes sense. Hopefully you start with... You know, I don't know, transportation, food. I was going to say transportation, income level. I mean, you know. um, Yeah, I mean... One of the areas I think pharmacy can make the biggest impact on, I don't know if it's the most important one, but it's transportation, mm-hmm. right? You know, like between being able to deliver a medication to a person or be right. able to, you know, in theory, mail it to their house, you lose a lot of clinical impact at that point. But, mm-hmm. you know, delivery is a great 
way to kind of overcome that. Um, and it, it takes back to where we measured social determinants in renal care prior to mm -hmm. me being a pioneer. Um, Medicaid will pay for transportation from a person's house to their doctor's office. They don't pay for transportation from their house to their pharmacy. So we address that by delivering medications directly to the dialysis facility so the patient could pick them up in person. But there's a lot of places where you can't do that, right? I knew where they were going to be three days a week for three hours a day, um, but not every pharmacy delivers and not every patient's within delivery range of a pharmacy. Well, I'll tell you, with the pandemic, I, you know, as the pandemic was unfolding in March and April and beyond, I started to interview health plans to see how the, the pandemic was affecting potentially their, their quality um, ratings in, for the future. And just listened to how much pharmacists and pharmacies have stepped up from, from the health plan's perspective. Um, in terms of delivery, access, of course, there's testing, um, and you know, ultimately the, the immunization will be huge. Um, but just and back to the social determinants, you know, the MTM pharmacists have been conducting questions around obviously um, the pandemic opens the door to a discussion about how is this impacting you, but um, more of those social risk factor questions and triaging. So um, there's a lot of opportunity in, in this um, crisis has uh, really shed light on it for sure. Can, can you give me a, for instance, like give me a, for instance of like, I, I recorded this information. My, uh, I did my SDOH review. Give me a, for instance, on, on when you triage something or, or if you had the ultimate resources, right? Like to, to do that. Yeah. So the case kind of the scenario that I'm talking about is um, a pharmacist who is working for or with a mm -hmm. health plan. Right. Like an and IDN. So there, yeah. So there you have the infrastructure and, and you can successfully triage to a case manager or, right. Okay. So there, there's that infrastructure in place. So what that looks like everywhere else, you know, will likely be a little bit different. Right. Um, I think with our firm, it probably is relationships. It's building those relationships mm -hmm. you have mm -hmm. with either your public health departments right. or, um, or whatever food banks to or, your food right. banks, right? To 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 address nutrition or transportation. It's it's that's where you, you know we had Trip Logan on talking through. He's like, you know, he kind of gave us a list of three, four different entities in your in your community. You really need to know and know who they are, mm -hmm. and, and it really helped him. It seems like one just from a business perspective, but two to be able to address and to your point, triage where needed. Right. Yeah. And that's where you get spoiled when you work in, you know, integrated care. Right. When mm -hmm. my patient said, I can't get to X or I don't have enough food. We had a dietitian that we could refer to or a nurse case manager. Um, it's mm -hmm. just, that's how do you build that virtual toolkit to, to mm -hmm. refer to a team that doesn't work for you or with you? Right. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely luminaries like uh, trip who yeah. have, that's what good looks like. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. We'll have to tell Trip and put that little, <laughs> cut that out and send it to him. Like that's what Trip or that's what good looks like. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, <laughs> they can do, uh, they can do some graphics with this later. Um. <laughs> All right. So we, we did a lot of nerdy stuff. We're going to, we're going to jump into. Um, I would agree. One more quick pet story. You didn't mention Jeff, the fat cat. Oh, wow. We have, yeah, a, but... <laughs> we have, we have a cat named Jeff. He's obese. And his mm -hmm. automatic feeder ran out of batteries or stopped working. Nice. And oh, talk about food insecure. <laughs> it, it took us a week to get him to stop panicking <laughs> to know that that food would be delivered. Right. That's so funny. It's like PTSD like, on him. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he's very vocal about when he's, when he's hungry. Yes. That's so yeah. funny. That's so so funny. Um, Jeff and Doug are very well known on um, the Zoom world. <laughs> with work, so. In the Zoom world, yeah. That's true. Yeah. And they, you know, they've got a, a another dog named Marcel, and Marcel's what, a standard poodle. Is that right? Yeah, he's perfect. Yeah, he's Marcel. The, he's the Marcel is like the. Uh, got if, the fancier name. If you were it's to nice. be like Doug, is your like weird uncle Doug, who's not all there. <laughs> Marcel's like your aristocratic English gentleman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely perfect. 
That's yeah, he's constantly judging Doug's right. inferiority. His nose is always in the air. Their nose is usually always in the air. He's like, right. Doug, we, we really don't we don't urinate on people here. Right. That's, that's unacceptable. <laughs> Yeah, no, my kids, my kids do that. My dog, my I have. Oh God, people are gonna judge me here. I have two <laughs> dogs and technically four cats in my wow. house. Yeah, no, it, well, not all in my house, but anyway, and uh, they make regular appearances in Zoom classes at school awesome. as well. So everybody kind of knows Buster and yeah. Sadie. Those are the two dogs, and yeah, when, like, when cats are zoo. notorious for that too, right? If there's <laughs> something going on, they're gonna be right on it. No, he's gotten so many like. Yeah, yeah. Just he sent an email because the cat walked across the keyboard as he's working. Um, and I don't know. Yeah, well, and, and they've guys, been disruptive. You guys know about my dog Duke, um, who eats walls and and carpet <laughs> oh, and things yeah. like that. Do you know Bless about that, Duke. Lisa? Yeah. Yeah. So, I, yeah. goodness. Yeah, Duke I, is very sweet. I adopted a, a dog about I guess five years ago now. That is, he has some separation anxiety problems and panic problems so when he's left alone or a thunderstorm he goes ballistic and eats something um but when i for when i was interviewing with pioneer i, I got hired i came on and like probably a week after i was on a, a meeting with jeff and i we didn't have an office at the time so i was working at home and immediately right behind that i had three dogs at the time and duke and my other male dog decided that they were going to just destroy a pillow and so I'm on this call with my boss and a couple of other very important people. And all you see is this white puff cloud going off behind my back. And we had to stop the meeting because everybody was laughing. You just, no concentration <laughs> whatsoever. Yeah. Like, but luckily he didn't eat a you know door while we were on the meeting. I can't believe how many people have gotten puppies. I'm like, I know. Oh no. Right. I'm yeah, a little no, worried about what's going to happen when people go back to work. How many right. dogs are going to get taken to a shelter? It's right. Yeah, yeah people are pretty yeah, horrible. I, that. I don't want to end yeah, on that, but kind of, yeah, no, you really brought it down. You <laughs> um, <laughs> brought us down. Um, I'm like, you really don't need a puppy right now, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's not. It's not going to fill the hole. It's not going to fill. The no. hole. <laughs> It'll make it worse. Right. It's like people who have a kid to save a marriage. It's just Jeez, not realizing man. that that's the worst way to Getting do it. Dark. All right. This took a dark turn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it did. And not recommended. But yeah. Um, also, it's a terrible idea. <laughs> and if Jess ever listens to this, my marriage is going and fantastic. Lisa, Lisa's at this point. She's like, I'm not affiliated with these people. <laughs> you know, it only made your marriage stronger. Beautiful Ellie. Yeah, I'm I'm a little worried. Like she's she's charming and she knows it, and that allows mm -hmm. her to get away with a lot more things. So I'm gonna have to like intentionally not allow her to do stuff. She has learned to suck people in. I, I know that yeah. when I've been over yeah. there, she's like, "Hey, yeah, you, this is my thing." And I'm like, "Okay, cool." And she'll like get you a little closer, bring you something else, bring you a little closer, bring you something else. And I'm just, all of a sudden I'm in and I'm playing Barbies and I've had a tea party. Very bad. You look up, you don't know what's going on. So um. Just to be fair to Doug, Ellie did pee on my daughter's bed. That's true. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> it was payback. I forgot about that. Yeah. No, she's uh, no. Oh, yeah. Love Ellie. It. Love yeah. it. The one that peed on my bed. Right. Yeah. yeah. It, was Doug's, it was Doug's retribution. <laughs> Doug's, Doug's like, I remember this. Right. Probably orchestrated by Marcel. Yeah. <laughs> Marcel was like, nah, man, it can't happen. Right. That, that girl's never allowed back over. Right. No, she's, I love her. She's so sweet. She's fun too. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for being on with us. As far, as far as like with PQ, how can people get involved? How can people get engaged? Yeah. Um, well, sign up for newsletters. Mm -hmm. um, obviously join. Yeah. You know, that's the best way. Um, but uh contribute to comment periods when we have measures Makes that sense. are we're thinking about developing or just about to the finish line. Um, participate in our quality forum webinars that are open. Um, some of them are closed to members only. Um, but yeah, um, we're small. Um, we're very responsive cool. to to all who reach out to us. So um, just just ping us and and see how you can get involved. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for being on and Appreciate um, it. hope you have a good weekend and, and thank you for, for spending an hour with us. My pleasure. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you for listening to this Catalyst podcast. 
If you enjoyed this episode, please consider liking, subscribing, and or following us. Give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts to help us reach more amazing pharmacy people like you. Follow PioneerX on your preferred social media platform for the latest up-to-date pharmacy news and content.